Hi, it's Roberto Mickey again, and we've got a great video today on a giant cell tumor of tendon sheath. This tumor is one of the three most common tumors in the hand, and we're gonna show a video today on how we excise one from a patient in their left hand over the index finger A1 pulley. Here's a plug for the channel. Hit subscribe and hit like to help out this channel. This is a little warning and a viewer discretion. The remainder of this video is from a surgery, so if you don't wanna see the inside of somebody, please click away at this point in time. Giant cell tumors of tendon sheath are extremely common. They are one of the top three tumors of the hand and they are a benign process. Benign means that they are not a cancer that's going to kill you, but they can be locally aggressive to the point where they can destroy both bone and tendons. So in general, we don't leave these tumors in place and we tend to remove them so that they don't cause local problems. Unfortunately, we don't know what causes these tumors. They are sporadic, but they can be found usually on the palm side of the hand and usually near a joint or a tendon. The tumor has a very distinct clinical appearance. It typically has like a hard mass, which is a little bit harder than your average, for example, ganglion cyst. And when you open up the tumor and expose it and see it, it has an orange glow to it. Uh, and this is caused by the deposition of something called hemosiderin. And hemosiderin basically is iron that's been left over after some sort of bleeding episode from the tumor. That hemosiderin is responsible for its distinct clinical appearance and for its appearance on MRI, both on T1 and on T2 imaging. The tumor has a very distinct appearance. It has a low signal intensity on both sequence series. So by this point in the video, you've seen us inject the local anesthetic, and at this point in time, we're going to use an Esmark and sort of exsanguinate the extremity and then raise the tourniquet to 250 millimeters of mercury to control the bleeding and prevent any excessive blood from obstructing our view during surgery. So what you can see here in the upper right-hand corner is an ultrasound of the tumor itself in our office just prior to surgery. And what you can see is that the mass is this sort of darkish black area with a little bit of gray in it, and that's sitting just superficial to the flexor tendons. This area just superficial to the flexor tendons, if it were distinctly black and had no gray in it, would be more consistent with a ganglion cyst. And because it has a little bit of gray in it, it's more consistent with a soft tissue mass than a cyst. And you will see when we make the incision that the mass is sitting almost directly below the skin and very consistent what we see in this ultrasound. So we're just testing that the patient is fully numb and we're palpating where the tumor is uh, to decide where to make our incision. Usually these tumors are painless and in this case the patient had no pain and she just noticed that there was this lump there which started spontaneously. Another very interesting fact about this tumor is that histologically, or under the microscope, this tumor looks almost identical to something called pigmented villonodular synovitis. PVNS is found very commonly in the knee, and so it's just interesting that it looks almost identical under the microscope, and that if you didn't tell the pathologist where it came from, they could have mistaken it for PVNS. So you can see here that we're beginning the surgery and we're using a scalpel, which is a 15 blade scalpel, to make the incision directly over the mass. So we're gonna make an incision about one and a half centimeters in length over the mass and we'll then use a tenonomy scissor to bluntly dissect in and around the mass. The mass is gonna sort of pooch through the wound here in the next few seconds right there and it has a slightly more orange look or hue to it than the surrounding subcutaneous fat. In general, this tumor tends to have an orange sort of glow to it or brownish glow to it. And that's from, once again, the hemosiderin staining the tumor itself. At this point, we're carefully dissecting around the mass, uh, separating it from the surrounding tissues, including the subcutaneous fat and the underlying tendon sheath and A1 pulley below it. We're using these special retractors called Ragnell retractors. We're using a Adson forceps pickup to help hold tissue and to help us dissect carefully around the mass. And we're taking great care not to sort of disturb the mass and try to take it out all as one piece and just to remove it gently from the surrounding tissues, just bluntly separating it. 
but not actually cutting the tumor itself so we don't spill any of the tumor cells uh, into the surrounding tissue. So at this point in time we're going to take a special clamp called an Alice clamp, not Alice like Alice in Wonderland, but Alice, A-L-L-I-S. And this clamp uh, we're gonna use to grasp onto the tumor itself so that we can manipulate and sort of handle the tumor. Uh, and that way it can help me to pull it one, to, in one direction so that I can dissect underneath it and separate it from the underlying A1 pulley uh, without uh, damaging the tumor. Uh, and in this case, uh, you'll see me separate it and the mass will come out here in uh, one large piece and we'll be able to measure it and uh, see how it looks uh, separated from uh, the other tissues and the rest of the hand. So we're going to measure the tumor here and it's going to measure right around 8 millimeters in diameter which is a relatively large ma uh, mass for uh, this area of the hand. So at this point in the surgery I'm going to perform an A1 pulley release and A1 pulley partial excision and the reason for this is twofold first reason is because I want to remove any remaining tumor that might be left behind because this tumor was relatively adherent to the a1 pulley number two is to perform a trigger finger release so that the patient does not develop a trigger finger later and also if a future surgeon sees this scar doesn't think well how does this person have a trigger finger if they've already had a trigger finger release so this will help future surgeons and also prevent any kind of recurrence. So trigger fingers are a relatively common problem and they are caused by the flexor tendons being enlarged or the A1 pulley being enlarged or scarred, not allowing the flexor tendons to glide freely in this area. And there are two flexor tendons in each finger. There's the flexor digitorum profundus and there's the flexor digitorum superficialis. And these tendons go from basically the forearm all the way to our fingertips. But from this area, right where the knuckle is on the palm side of the hand, all the way to the tip of the finger, the tendons are covered by a sock or flexor tendon sheath. And there are these pulleys, and the pulley responsible for the trigger finger is this A1 pulley, which is this first one here. The two most important pulleys as far as for preventing bow stringing or causing uh, the tendon to basically come sep become separated from the bone are the A2 and the A4 pulleys and those need to be preserved uh, with any surgery in the fingers or fingertips. So at this point in the surgery we've removed the A1 pulley or part of it to prevent recurrence of the mass. Now we're going to inject something called Pivocaine, and then the dose that we're using is 0.5%, and this is a long-acting local anesthetic that should last anywhere between 6 to 12 hours, giving the patient good post-operative analgesia. The brand name of the medication is Neuropin, also 0.5%. So at this point in time, we're gonna to start to close the wound, and uh, I tend to use a 5.0 nylon to close the skin. But uh, while we're closing and you're watching that, we'll discuss some of the anatomy. So we're talking about the pulley system and they're basically annular pulleys and they're cruciate pulleys. But the annular pulleys, there's two that are important. Once again, the A2 and the A4 pulley. And the A2 pulley is found over the proximal phalanx and the A4 pulley is found over the middle phalanx. And you can sort of remember the pulleys interestingly by the odd numbers being over the joints and the even numbers being over the phalanges or the phalanxes. And so uh, if you look at the A1 pulley, it's sitting directly over the metacarpophalangeal joint. The A2 pulley is sitting right over the proximal phalanx. The A3 pulley is sitting directly over the proximal interphalangeal joint. And then the a4 pulley is sitting directly over the middle phalanx and then the A5 pulley is sitting over the distal interphalangeal joint. So that's going from proximal to distal. In this video, left is proximal and right is distal. So you can see me doing this suture and this kind of suture that we're putting in is a 5 nylon but we're putting it in a horizontal mattress. Uh, and this horizontal mattress is a good way of everting the skin or basically bringing the skin edges um, out and making them kiss each other um, head on. And this takes a lot of tension off the wound and gives you a nice cosmetic closure. 
Um, we tend to take out the sutures in approximately one week. Uh, and uh, I tend to use fibonyolin because um, it is a relatively inert suture that uh, doesn't cause a lot of reactions. The assistant here is cutting the sutures with a straight mayo type scissor. Uh, and this is a good scissor for cutting sutures as it is relatively large uh, and uh, straight. But notice they're using good technique and cutting the suture with the very tips of the suture scissor. You do not want to be cutting sutures with the back part of the scissors or the deep part of the scissors because you could be concentrating on the proximal end of the scissors and not realize that you're cutting something that's important, such as an artery or nerve, with the tips of the scissors. This is something called passing point and it is a break in good technique. Now at this point in the surgery, it's not that big a deal to cut with the back end of the scissors, but it is good practice to continue to practice good technique throughout the surgery so that you get into this habit of using the tips of the scissors. And when you're doing more important parts of the surgery, such as when you're dealing with nerves or arteries, you use that good habit throughout those more difficult and more dangerous parts of the surgery. So at this point, we've placed a zero form dressing, which is a Vaseline gauze with bismuth. And then we're putting gauze between the fingers to prevent maceration of the skin between the fingers. We then apply a Curlex roll, which is a gauze that's in a roll form, which will absorb any kind of bleeding and also prevent any kind of swelling by adding even pressure around the hand. We will then tape or secure this gauze and bandage in place with something called a Coban dressing, which is a self-adhesive dressing uh, that sticks to itself but doesn't stick to the patient's skin. There is no perfect dressing for the hand and lots of surgeons put in uh, put on much lighter dressings and many surgeons put on much heavier dressings and it's sort of just you need to find a technique or dressing that works for yourself uh, and for your patients. I encourage my patients to move their fingers right away and that they should be moving their fingers directly in the recovery room, uh, especially since this patient was done in our local, we instruct them right away to start moving the fingers uh, and to prevent any scar tissue from forming. We saw this patient approximately one week after the surgery and removed the sutures and we actually have a video from the post-operative visit. This is a short video of the patient in their, at their first post-operative visit and you can see that they have full range of motion of the finger. The wound is well healed and we'll take out their stitches today. We did get pathology which confirmed that this tumor was a giant cell tumor of tendon sheath. Hope you loved the video and uh, we'll see you at the next one.